right now, I would like to say a massive hello and a very warm welcome to uh, Anisha, Daniela, and Sophie, who I believe are all with me on the call here. Yes, here we got Anisha, we got Sophie, and we got Daniela. Brilliant. Um, how are you feeling all today? Who goes first? <laughs> Who goes first? Okay. Yeah, I'm all right. I'm excited. Um, it's been ages since um, I came to a React JS girl, so really excited that this is happening. Excellent. So glad to hear that. We're very excited to have you here. And how are you doing, Anisha? Yeah, good. It's my first React JS girls conference, so excited, excited to see what's in store. Fantastic. Welcome. Glad to have you on board. And Daniela? Hello, hello. Yes, also really happy to be with you. I hope to share something interesting today. Well, I had a little sneak peek at uh, your, all of your presentations, so I know there is exciting stuff in there and there's a lot of things to learn, so I'm very excited about that. Um, so for those of you who don't know our speakers, I thought that maybe we could just um, give you uh, give your an opportunity to just say a few words about yourselves, what are you working on, who are you, etc. cetera. Um, so Phil, let's start with you because you started before, so why not? Sure. Um, so I'm a senior web engineer at Monzo, and I'm also one of the web discipline leads, which doesn't mean that I punish people. It means that I kind of lead the web discipline, um, which is stuff like best practices and um, kind of the direction of, of, of how we're doing web at Monzo, which is great. Um, and I live in London, um, obviously not working in the office at the moment. Um, what else can I tell you? I like to sing in a choir. I nearly logged in as my choir to this, uh, which would have been very embarrassing indeed. Um, yeah, that's about it, really. Awesome, great. Um, yeah, I think everyone probably most definitely heard about Monso. And uh, I think, Sophie, don't worry about it. You know, if it doesn't go well, you can sing us a song. So <laughs> it's going to be awesome. Absolutely not going to happen. <laughs> OK, I won't push you for it, I promise. Um, Anisha, do you want to go next? Yeah, sure. So um, I've, Anisha, I've been at IBM for about three and a half years. Um, I'm currently working on a project I can't tell you about, um, but it's been a really exciting journey. Um, I studied engineering at university, so coding is kind of like something I've picked up by myself. Um, and what else? I mean, I grew up in Kenya, which is which is quite, quite that's my fun fact, my go to fun fact. Um, but yeah, that's that's me. Awesome. Thank you for, for thank you for being here. As you said, it's your first time, so we're very excited. And Daniela? Hello, so uh, my name is Daniela. I live in Lisbon, in Portugal. Um, I'm an engineer at Dashlane, which is basically a, a password manager. I'm in the web product team. Uh, I used to organize the JavaScript meetup in Lisbon, so uh, quite some relationships with this meetup here. Uh, I love uh, photography but I haven't done much since uh, what we had in 2020, um, unfortunately. Uh, and my interest on the web range from accessibility uh, to web security. And recently I've been learning a bit about web cryptography. That's awesome. And I'm glad to hear that you uh, are interested in accessibility because as it happens, we have a talk on that today. So, you know, double whammy positive for you. Um, so obviously you all mentioned sort of, we are now in this 2020 has passed finally. And uh, well, I say that we are <laughs> in 2021 and I'm not sure if it's getting any better, but um, the year has been quite extraordinary for everybody and unprecedented times and all that. But I actually wanted to ask you if something positive has happened, has there been anything that through all of this has actually been a really good learning for you or, or something new that you um, discovered about yourself or something. Um, so uh, yeah, that's, that's to all the three of you. And I'm gonna start with Sophie again. I was just thinking my answers, this is really rubbish. Um, so I definitely realized how much more energy I have not commuting because my commute to work is, um, is usually about an hour and 10 minutes or so. Um, which I don't mind, but I've definitely got more energy in the evenings now, which is quite nice. That is that is a good thing. That is a good thing. A lot of time saving as well. So awesome. And Anisha, anything from your side? 
Yeah, well, thankfully, I've not had a positive COVID test, so uh, that's one. Um, but I got time to start an Instagram page. So I really like uh, cooking and eating mainly more than cooking. So I started a page um, to kind of like showcase restaurants in London and recipes. And I'm vegetarian, so it's like all about veggie recipes. So if any of you are doing veganuary, you can check out my page. This is clickbait now. This is this is me <laughs> completely clickbaiting. <laughs> It's okay, don't worry. Um, I will definitely check that out because I'm a vegetarian myself, so uh, I will definitely get some inspiration from that. Awesome. And uh, so, Daniela, what what have you uh, what have you come across this year that's been really good for you? Uh, so I will also check your page because I'm trying to do some uh, some uh, vegetarian dishes. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, on my side, I think it was mainly. Um, taking the time to be with my family and also giving more value, value to, to the time I was with my parents and my parents-in-law because it was really a short amount of time and we, we started to give much more value to that short amount of time. So I guess that was really good. Awesome, that is great as well. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's all. It's nice to hear that, you know, even though this has happened, we all have had some positive experiences. So that is fantastic. Um, so I think it is time to let the talks get started because ultimately that's why we are all here. And um, so to everyone on uh, the viewing, remember to post any questions on the slide link and for, for the Q&A afterwards where all the three speakers will come back. So I'm going to let the first speaker, um, well, Anisha, you're already here. So actually, I'm going to ask the other two speakers to go off camera for a moment, and then we welcome you back later. Thank you so much. Um, Anisha, the digital stage is all yours. Thanks. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. Go for oh. it. OK. Oh, I think you're going to have to give me a minute for some reason. Zoom was not letting me share my screen earlier, so I'm going to have to rejoin the call. Sorry, I should have checked this earlier. That is absolutely not a problem at all. Uh, we'll just hang tight. In the meantime, what I'll do while you do that, I'm going to have a little skim through the chat and see what the word is, what are people talking about. Uh, hello from St. Petersburg, Russia. Hello. Uh, what is her page? I'm guessing that's referring to the vegetarian Instagram page. Uh, I'm sure that we get back to that later. We have an, uh, let me see here. Oh, I think someone has found it and posted it. And we have an aloha. Did I see an aloha from the depths of London? Indeed. Hello there. Uh, Nottingham, Germany. Interesting. We got a lot of people here for the first time. So very excited that all of you found it. And Ecuador, wow, hola, that is far away, this is awesome. We have people from everywhere. And hey, he was excited. Well, as you can tell, I'm very excited. We all very excited. And now here we are, Anisha is back. I hand over to you, Anisha. There we go, sorry about that. Um, cool, yeah, so what I want to take you through today is my first journey as technical lead on a project. and. What it was, was going from zero to production in 60 days. And this might sound like a, a horror story, but this was the ask. Um, so what, what COVID-19 brought to the University of Arts London was a situation where students couldn't upload, I mean, couldn't attend their showcase. So this showcase is a platform for students to go in and display their work. And what happens is a lot of these students are art students and fashion students, and that's where they get scouted. So when, when they were left with a situation where these students didn't have a way to progress in their career, they kind of reached out to IBM and asked them to develop a platform for their students. And this platform meant that they could upload their work in five different formats. So it was photo, sound, 3D, PDFs, and video. Um, it all had to be mobile friendly. And then moderators would have to go in, moderate the work, and then this would go worldwide. So anybody could go into the site and see it. Um, it was a big ask. And what it did was trigger what I like to call production phobia for me. Um, and to me, this is a, coin I've a term I've coined, which is the fear of messing up a production environment. And, and I think this plays into a common um, syndrome like experienced by people in the technical community called imposter syndrome. 
um, which I could do a whole talk about, but but that's not what this one's about. So we managed to put it in production and, and what was developed was a really cool site, which I wanna show you. Um, so if you go to the graduatesharecase.arts.ac.uk, you're taken to this really lovely homepage um, and you can see this is exactly what we built. Colleges could come in, they could bring collections of artwork. So different, different things like um, the fashion college wanted to show uh, direction. Um, and then you could come in and look through all the students' projects. You could scroll, it was an infinite scroll that we put in. So this randomizes projects. So if I were to refresh this page, it would load a different set of projects. Um, it's a bit slow now, uh, cause it's, and if you go in, we can see a student's project. You can see a little carousel where you can kind of loop through all the projects. Um, and this really made me appreciate art. I ended up spending a lot of pro time procrastinating and going through all the different students work while doing this. Um, but we, we managed to go in, you can see the different students pages. This is all running on AWS and to speed up uh, these images loading in, we used CloudFront, which is one of the AWS services that lets you cache items. Uh, you can go through the different project pages. Um, and, and this was all built in React and the backend that we used was a platform called Strapi. So if I go back to my slides, this is the technical stack we had. So it was a React front end, which was talking to a headless CMS called Strapi, which is really nice because it's open source. And I'll talk a bit about that in a second. And Strapi was then talking to UAL systems. So UAL had their own system uh, on WordPress where students would go in and upload work. Strapi would pull this data out of UAL's WordPress site and then give it to our React front end. And why Strapi was so nice was it had a really easy to use UI um, and this was all open source so we didn't have to, to pay anything and with a project like this where it's an instant response to a situation and, and the funding may not have been as much as like a big long project, it was a really nice way to use Strapi. So as you can see, you can create different collection types. So this is a demo um, and this is collection types of say restaurants. What we had was obviously projects um, and then you can, you can give it different categories. So you can say, I want it to have IDs. Um, and the, re the way that we built our college pages so if you go into the site, you can see there's eight different colleges. Each of these colleges has subjects and each of these subjects has courses. So there was a lot of different um, aspects we had to consider. And each of these courses and colleges wanted to create a page for themselves. So if we were to do this in React itself, this would have been a quite a long list of pages to be creating a lot of routes. But what Strapi gave us the capacity to do was create slugs for these pages. So slug is just what this end of um, a URL is. And with these slugs, we could then go in and create all the different pages quite dynamically using Strapi. And in Strapi itself, if you have a play around, you can, you can go in and create the slugs as the data uh, uh, a, one of the kind of fields of a collection type. And what was really cool as well was these colleges all wanted custom content in this little banner here. And we harnessed um, a, an, uh, an added application called Storybook. So if you're a React developer, you've probably heard of Storybook, but for those of you who haven't, Storybook is this really nice feature that lets you go in and see all your components and play around with them. So anybody can guess which which component um, library this com I mean which company this component library is for. Uh, it's probably not one we've used much this year, but it's Airbnb. Um, and as you can see, you can see all the different components. You can interact with them. Um, we have another one. This one's IBM's one. Um, and what's really cool is you can see exactly how this component was built. So you can see the code, but you can also interact with it. So if I wanted to change different aspects of this button. Um, you can say, I want the text to show up for, for 2000 seconds instead. And it lets you show your client or even just different developers on the project what already exists. And for us, this is really important was because we, to create this custom content for each of these college pages without doing it ourselves, we were able to extract HTML um, of, from these React components and then let the, let the college pages copy it. So they could take these components, take a little React, uh, HTML chunk of what was there and then just plug it into Strapi straight away for 
the React uh, site to render. And this was also using um, a style sheet. So we had different classes described as well. So the style sheet would define all the different classes for the styles. And then Storybook would output the React component with the styles and in the HTML. So that lay, let us create like hundreds of dynamic pages for all these different colleges and art students. Um, a little bit more about Strapi is we, we talked to Strapi using its um, REST API endpoint. So we, you could go into root and you'd get the entire endpoint in JSON. But what Strapi also exposes is a really nice GraphQL endpoint. So if I go here, this is a GraphQL program. So GraphQL, for those of you who, who might not know what GraphQL is, is a query language for APIs, which provides you a complete um, and understandable description of all the data in your API. And what it does is it gives you the power to ask for exactly what you need and nothing more. So I'll show you a quick demo of talking to my Strapi instance. So I want to write a query to say, get a category from, from Strapi. So say I want to ask for a, uh, let's have a look, category itself, let's do that. So if I come in here and I say I want a category, it gives you a really nice autofill. I want to say I, would say I want to get the category for ID one. So if I come in here and I say ID one, and then I want to get back, let's see what fields are available to me. So say I want to get back a, name so let's let's just return a name for from from graphql um all i do is go in and say name it tells me what type it will return and i should be getting back french which makes sense because that's what what's in here so it gives you a really nice data model um and graphql is being used by lots of big companies nowadays so um shopify I think Airbnb uses GraphQL and it's a really nice interface for React to whatever CMS or pretty much any backend you have. Um, so that's 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 all about GraphQL and Strapi and how we built the stack. Um, open, so a shout out to Strapi for being open source and I think open source really helps create quality products and lets us give back to the community as well. Um, the other thing I wanted to touch upon was the lessons that I learned. So, this was my first project going into production. And some of these lessons might seem obvious, but to me, they were things that are quite important for anybody who's doing a project um, and putting it into production. And the first one is tests are your best friend. So having really strong integration and unit tests meant that if data changed, we were aware of it when it happened. Um, we had rigid testing for our UI. So any unexpected changes were caught and we didn't spend time kind of like debugging and going through code, rather our tests picked it up. In a virtual situation, it's really important to trust your team. So whether you're a senior developer, whether you're a junior developer, whether you're a technical lead, just ensuring that you're trusting your team to do the right thing is just super important, especially on such a hard deadline. Um, while this project had a fixed deadline, Agile is what made it work. Um, and why that is, is because we built up the site in chunks. So for example, if we go to the, the product listings page, so project listings page, sorry, um, we built this up in little steps. So the first step was to make sure we could load in projects. Second step was to do a search. Um, third step was then iterating on that and to be able to filter results. So we didn't reach that point, but what we did have was a working page which could search and that was the, like the minimal viable product and so even though client wanted more being able to deliver x amount of work agile was was what made us be able to go live in production with a working site um pdfs are a nightmare i mean this was a personal one that i that i kind of like picked up on and if anybody has any good advice on how to get pdfs working in react any advice would be very helpful Document your data models and API responses. So ensuring that you know exactly what your application is expecting. Um, GraphQL provides a really good interface for this. So, I mean, if you are using GraphQL, you don't really need to document it because you do have, oops, you do have your schemas. But if not, then having good source of truth for what your application is expecting will save you a lot of hassle down the line and a lot of Slack messages that are unnecessary. Um, DevOps and dev should start from day one, making sure that you have your dev environments and you're stating 
and having a staging environment and making sure this isn't a process that's going hand in hand will make sure that when it comes to it, you can deploy to your production environment when development is happening. And the last one is that designers and development should always go hand in hand. So when we were building this site, we had a lot of back and forth with the designers to try and reduce anything that didn't need to be as complicated as it was. And ensuring that you have this good relationship with your designers means that you can push back and they can push back on things that they think are important. So that's 15 minutes on how we built something in 16 days. Um, and I hope this kind of like shows you how if you wanted to use um, Strapi and React for a personal project, how easy it is, because we managed to do this in about four sprints, so eight weeks with a dev team of about three people. Um, and, and, you know, this is, this is being used worldwide now. Um, so for personal projects, I really recommend using open source software, using things like Strapi, GraphQL and React to create a stack to, to build something up for where you can go in and load your data and, and display it in a really nice, easy, searchable way. Um, yeah, so thank you. No, th thank you, uh, Anisha. That was great, uh, very interesting. Uh, I'm sure that there will be some questions um, based on that. I know for sure I already have some, but yeah. I'm gonna hold my questions like we all should to the end, to the Q and A. Um, so we are actually going to jump straight into our next speaker, but I just wanted to point out that I was just having a quick look through the chat and um, we have people from Turkey and Egypt and yeah, it's just keep on growing and Lebanon, it's super awesome, very, very exciting. Um, so, right, our second speaker, Daniela, uh, please take the digital stage. So I hope you already can see my screen. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, so let's jump into it. Just restarting my timer. Uh, so I'm going to talk a bit about uh, cryptography. Uh, this is something I've been looking at in the past months. Um, it's uh, like one of my hobbies right now. It's also related to the, the work I'm doing uh, at Dashlane. Uh, and I wanted to know more, basically, to be able to jump into some conversations. And uh, this is basically the way I feel about cryptography, like just a junior uh, trying to, to learn something like this small baby here. Um, and also, uh, as kind of a joke, uh, in a way, I wanted it to, to help me to de decrypt uh, my send messages. So yeah, initially, cryptography feels like a, felt like a monster to me, but right now, uh, I'm trying to, to learn much more than the basics, so I want to, to share that with you. Uh, why cryptography and why that's something uh, relevant? Uh, basically, crypto and cryptography uh, has some Greek roots, uh, where crypto means hidden and graphy means to write. Uh, and uh, basically what we want is to write something that uh, must be private or hidden in a way. Um, so the whole idea is to try to turn a message that is public, like I want water, into something that is impossible to, to understand uh, by applying some kind of mathematical functions or doing some operations in the data in the message that will turn the data into a sequence of bytes. And in that way, we are going to create some kind of confidential mes message and we will see that uh, basically we'll need a key for that. Uh, this is basically encryption, turning the, the plain text into ciphertext. The reverse process is called decryption, uh, which is turning the ciphertext into plain text. Um, this came also from, a, so from some interesting uh, uh, routes that a lot of um, uh, things involved. And one of them was uh, the Caesar uh, cipher. And uh, basically, uh, it was used from uh, uh, Julius Caesar to communicate privately. Uh, with his generals, with his friends. Uh, and um, basically, uh, if you look at it, it's basically a subst substitution uh, cipher. Uh, and uh, you can also play with this website that I have here. here. Uh, let's say the message is attack. Uh, in this case, I selected the Caesar cipher, but you can select many more and play with it. 
and uh, it turned into this word that I can't really tell, uh, but it's basically an alphabet uh, substitution with a shift of four. And uh, basically, when someone intercepted this, uh, they thought uh, it was some kind of uh, foreign language. Uh, but in the end, uh, it's just like a substitution of some letters in the in the sheet, doing a shift basically in the alphabet. And uh, as you may notice, it's obviously uh, easily broken right now. Uh, so I'd like to to try to introduce the topic by explaining some of the naming mistakes we sometimes do, uh, and also try to clarify a bit that uh, we are going to talk about uh, what is obfuscating, encoding, hashing, encrypting, or decrypting as we talked a bit already, and signing and verifying uh, a message. So what is uh, obfuscating? Obfuscating is mainly creating some kind of uh, obstacle, uh, basically making the code or the message really difficult to, to read, but uh, it's not an impossible mission. Basically, uh, you can use it when you don't want to expose details, for instance, the company details. Uh, and uh, one great example, of course, is, is code obfuscation. Uh, one uh, one thing that we can do is variable uh, name replacement, but you can also uh, do stuff like introduce some code that doesn't do anything just for the ends of uh, creating some confusion uh, and uh, making it more difficult to be reverse engineered. Uh, another one is encoding, and the whole thing about encoding is that we want to have some kind of uh, transportable data that we want to, to exchange with some other devices. Uh, let's say, uh, and show it in different uh, uh, platforms. So one, uh, one good example is, is basically uh, compression, for instance, that you can uh, have uh, compression on the files and that will make the data much more smaller and also easier to transfer. It's not, not about uh, the confidentiality of the data, but much more about transforming the data into something. A great example that all of us uh, probably have seen is the URL encoding. So in this case, uh, a space in hello meetup will be turned into percentage 20, that's encoding. Uh, of course, this is also something we can, the rules are set with the, the algorithms used are set. So basically you can also try that on, on your own. Um, and the, actually, there's a, a fun thing about that. Uh, at some point, the different browsers had different rules. Uh, and the, actually, that led to some security issues. Another one is emojis. So we all, all these emojis in some platforms, let's say messaging apps that we are trying to move our friends to. Uh, and the encoding, uh, in this case, you have the same encoding for it, but the presentation is going to be different in the different platforms. Another example is image encoding. I'm not sure if any of you uh, saw this uh, article from Jake Archibald about uh, AVs. Basically, this encoding it's similar to what is done in uh, AV1 video. Uh, but the, the whole idea is that it's, it's a bit uh, lighter on the web in comparison with WebP. So I recommend you to highly check this, this blog post about it. Hashing, so we reached one that is really important for cryptography. Hashing is basically to help uh, to confirm that uh, the integrity of a file, uh, it, that that file is, is, was not changed, was not tempered uh, by someone. And uh, probably uh, you have seen that uh, when you try to use uh, Bootstrap, for instance, if you go to the Bootstrap website, you see that there is an integrity uh, attribute in the link uh, HTML element, uh, and uh, that uh, integrity attribute actually has the name of the algorithm that is used for hashing. In this case, it's SHA-384. And after that, you have the integrity value. So it's like a checksum that's done on the, on the value, on the file. So if the file changed, that, that, uh, that value is going also to change. That's the powerful thing about hashing. The, the hash is going to change if the input is different. It's also used a lot with the with passwords. So basically, if you do some kind of of um, if you save the passwords in your website, uh, you probably are going to save the hash, not the password itself. Let's hope. Uh, and uh, sometimes you could you could think that you could have this problem because the same input is going to produce uh, the, the 
uh, the same output here. So we have uh, the, the first and the third passwords are the same. Uh, and basically what we do is not uh, using directly the, the hash that is provided. There's also uh, a salt value that is used if you, if you ever use by crypt or S script uh, or even other uh, key deviation functions. Uh, basically, you can introduce this random value that could be used. And in that case, if you use the salt and the password to create the hash, the hash is absolutely going to be different. And that's the main thing about the hashes. Basically, it's not possible to be reversed and two passwords are not ever going to be the same. So if someone attacks the database, they will not be able to try to understand what's going on there. So in a way, we can think that hashing is kind of one-way encryption uh, because it's impossible to get the, the original value from the hash. And uh, that's how we reach encryption and decryption. And uh, we talked a bit about, about it in the beginning. But uh, the main thing about encrypting is that there is a secret key. Uh, and uh, one of the things that is really important is not to share your keys publicly. So let's say in GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, or whatever you use. And uh, there's this quote from this um, uh, go governmental uh, institution in the USA, which is NIST. Uh, it's basically a USA go uh, organization that tries to help businesses to reduce the risk uh, of cyber attacks. So basically, they are saying that uh, uh, what we just talked, confidentially can be obtained through encryption and only the person that have or the persons that have the keys are able to decrypt the encrypted information. And we cannot talk about uh, cryptography without talking about uh, symmetric and asymmetric encryption. And in order to, to understand that a bit more, I have some drawings, so hold on with me. Uh, <laughs> so a symmetric encryption basically uses the same key. Imagine uh, that you want to encrypt your disk or you want to send some message to a friend. Uh, basically, you are going to use the same key for this process. And that key has to be shared between the two parties. Uh, this has some issues in a way, because um, if you have more than two people, it's a bit difficult to understand who sent the message because the key is the same. Uh, another problem is how to share that specific message. And that's why uh, asymmetric encryption came into, into its form. And uh, it's also called private key encryption. So it's also, if you search for it, it's, it's nice to know. So it could be asymmetric encryption or public key encryption, and it's a bit more complex. So it takes uh, much more time than symmetric uh, encryption. For instance, uh, most of the algorithms that use a symmetric encryption actually use prime numbers. Uh, so you can imagine that it's going to be much slower than the other. So actually what uh, is, is done in the end, uh, uh, much, much of the times is that uh, we use an hybrid approach with asymmetric encryption and asymmetric encryption. And we'll get there. So in order to explain this a bit more, I'd like to, sh to present you uh, Sarah and John. Uh, I was really tired of reading examples with Alice and, Alice and Bob uh, about the symmetric encryption. So I decided to change the names and uh, now they are Sarah and John. Uh, I hope you don't mind. So actually what's going on is that we don't have one key like we had in symmetric encryption, but we have actually four keys. Uh, the private keys are supposed to be retained by the owner and the public keys are supposed to be uh, shared publicly. So imagine that Sarah wants to send a message uh, to John, to his friend. Uh, she is going to encrypt the data with John's public key, which is publicly av available and she creates some ciphertext. John is going to receive that message and it's going to take a look at that. And he's the only one that can decrypt the message because he has the private key. He can do the decryption. So this is the whole thing about uh, symmetric encryption and how, and how it could be done quite, uh, let's say, not easily because it's really complex, but in a way. Uh, and one thing to, to also think about in this is that if asymmetric encryption gets broken uh, in any way and that uh, uh, mathematical operations that are being done with the prime numbers, uh, a lot of tools that we use in our day-to-day -day life will break also. Um, there's also 
an asymmetric encryption is something called signing and verifying. So imagine that Sarah wants to say that this message was actually uh, uh, created by her, and uh, we uh, actually she she actually wants to sign this message. So she's going to use her private key to create a, a, a signed message. And the signed message doesn't mean that she's actually signing the message. What happens, uh, because that would be really complex, what happens is that there is, uh, it's a bit uh, complicated to think about, but in a way it's uh, created the hash of the message and then she signs the hash of the message, which is much, much faster. So on the other side, when John receives the message, he basically looks into the, the, the signed message and he can use uh, the public key that Sarah has to verify that she, she was the one that sent the message. And in order to do that, basically, John is going to calculate himself the, the, the hash of the message and he can verify using the same algorithm that Sarah did uh, that the hash of the message and the hash that was sent, the one they calculated and the one that Sarah sent, were the same. So we know that it was Sarah that gave the message. There were there are a lot of use cases for for this uh, TLS, email, uh, password managers, Telegram, WhatsApp, whatever. Uh, I will try briefly to talk a bit about. Uh, one that is really important to all of us. Uh, of course, the big dream that doesn't let us sleep, everyone getting a secure connection. Um, and uh, what's important to talk about this is that this is all happening on the application layer. So basically when a message is sent through the TCP protocol and we want a, a secure communication, uh, we basically send the encryption information in uh, the application layer, we send the TLS. So in this case, we are going to see that we have an hybrid approach that I was talking about before with asymmetric and symmetric uh, encryption. Uh, in the beginning, the client sends the client hello in the handshake. Uh, and the, basically the client says, hey, here are my uh, all the algorithms that I support. Here are the cipher suites. Don't care about the, what is written here. This is just, okay, the, the client sends this, uh, sends the TLS versions that the client support the algorithms that we, we can use basically and the server is going to to answer saying oh i would like to use this one uh, for this connection so basically the uh, server is going to send also its public key and uh, also a digital signature that is basically something that is verified by a, a certificate authority i don't have time to explain much on that but i hope you get more or less the message and uh, in the end what happens is that uh, they exchange this uh, this message and they are going to turn from a asymmetric encryption to a symmetric encryption because the browser is going to look at the public key that the server sent it is going to validate the server certificate it's going to create a random session key uh, and is going to encrypt that session key with the public key from the server then the server is going to receive it and it's going to decrypt the server, the session key uh, with the private key that he owns. And the, from this moment on, they actually agreed on a, a, a session key that they are going to use to use semantic encryption. As you can see in this image on the, on the left, the server says, hey, here's my public key. Uh, and the client uh, or the browser just say, okay, cool. I'm going to encrypt this number with our public key. Let me send it to you. And in the, uh, on the right, you can see that they finally agreed on a session key. They are going to use it for everything. Uh, integrity is also really important. So when we send a message, we actually also send a message authentication code. And that's the uh, integrity bit of uh, of uh, the message that we are sending so after the end check when we start the the, the uh, sending the message to each other they actually are going to use the session key to create and verify uh, the this message authenticator uh, authentication code which is basically something that verifies that the integrity of the message that is being sent is correct and that they can believe that the message was not changed in the process and that they can trust it there are much more examples as I talked in uh, five minutes ago, I hope. Um, 
for instance, for instance, messaging apps, most of them are based in the signal protocol. Uh, I think it doesn't, uh, it, it's not related to the signal app itself. It's done by another company called Open Whisper, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and uh, basically they do, most of them do uh, a symmetric encryption in the beginning and then symmetric encryption after having a shared session key uh, when you want to, to share messages with your friends. Um, on a password manager is more or less this, the it's a bit different actually so uh, in the beginning to access your vault uh, what is used is basically a symmetric key and uh, if you want to share a password with a friend it's a symmetric key because you need to have a private key to share uh, to confirm uh, that everything uh, actually to sign the message and to confirm that uh, the messages that you receive or the passwords in this case are the ones that were supposed to be sent to you uh, and uh, you, for instance, uh, on the password manager side, and also for uh, most uh, instant messaging apps, if you are curious, there's the white papers from most of them. So it's really interesting documentation, let's say. Um, and for instance, for email, uh, you, there's a lot of documentation from ProtonMail uh, that helped me a lot to understand some stuff. Uh, what they do is basically they create a private key in, uh, in the browser, they encrypt uh, that uh, password with your password actually it's not the password but the hash of the password with your password and they send that to the server to authenticate you um, we don't have time for much more but uh, i'd like to say that what do these uh, all these cases have in common uh, all these examples have in common it's mainly that they try to not reinvent the wheel it's really important to do this cryptography thing uh, correct, but uh, also use the rules that are out there. Use the OpenSSL, for instance, that is highly validated. Uh, try to look at the approved algorithms from uh, relevant entities, such as NIST, the one I talked, and try basically to follow all the rules. Uh, you may ask also, why are we not using the most recent cryptography algorithms everywhere? And the, the main reason for that is that one of them we already talked, it's complexity, it takes time. Uh, a symmetric cryptography takes a lot of time in comparison with symmetric also. And sometimes it's a compromise uh, also between the UX. Um, another one uh, is that uh, some of the most recent standards and the protocols used in decryption uh, is mainly uh, could, could not be supported in, in all the devices out there. So it's a bit also different in that sense. Um, uh, another thing to, that you might want to take a look is the Web Crypto API that you can see and play a bit with it. Uh, there's a lot of things here you can search after, but uh, please do it with caution. Uh, and for Node.js, there's a lot of documentation. Documentation uh, on this is also really good, so you can understand a bit what's going on. And sometimes there are links that you help you to play with. So thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed as much as me. No, thank you again. Thank you, Daniela. Yeah, definitely. There was a lot of uh, things to learn from there. Um, not to just mention the uh, absolutely amazing gift game you clearly got going on top of all those amazing learnings. Um, right. So for anyone who have any questions or comment on Daniela's talk, please use the Slido link. Uh, and obviously, if you want to talk with others about it, use the chat. So we are now heading to our last speaker of this evening, uh, last but not least, of course. And I'd like to welcome Sophie. Hello. Right. Let me see if I can share my screen successfully. Absolutely. The digital spotlight is all yours. Is it working? I'm going to have to ask you. It is working. I can see it. Very good. Cool. Someone had to ask. So, um, ooh, my, um, so yeah, my name is Sophie. Um, did a brief intro at the beginning, but um, one of the things that my role as web discipline lead at Monzo involves is educating developers and designers about web accessibility. So it's, I guess, a favorite topic of mine. Um, and I'm going to go through some common things that people say about web accessibility and dig into whether they are fact or fiction. So 
Um, number one, most of your users don't have access needs. Uh, this is actually something that is often used to excuse not taking accessibility into account when you're designing or building a product. It is fiction. Um, so, you know, people might ask, you know, what's the point of making all these adjustments for the sake of accessibility if only a tiny proportion of our customers actually, you know, use screen readers or whatever? Um, and it is easier to assume that your users are just like you. And I use the word you quite generally here, but you might not even think about it. So you build your website and you think, yeah, that icon is obviously a menu icon. Um, that animation is cool to play when you land on the site for the first time. Um, and yeah, for like for you or for me, it probably is. But um, Microsoft have this great resource called the Inclusive Design Toolkit. And it says, if we use our own abilities and biases as a starting point, we end up with products designed for people of a specific gender, age, language ability, tech literacy, and physical ability. Those with specific access to money, time, and a social network. So my own abilities and experiences and, and knowledge shape how I interact with a website. And my experience might be totally different from yours. So even if you might know instinctively that a particular icon is, is a download button, others might not make that connection. So I've got fiber internet, I've got my nice MacBook, I've got a university degree and access to a lot of resources, you know, I'm, I'm lucky, but the people accessing the apps that I'm building aren't all gonna be in the same boat. And uh, the Inclusive Design Toolkit goes on to say, when it comes to people, there's no such thing as normal. The interactions we design with technology depend heavily on what we can see, hear, say, and touch. Assuming all those senses and abilities are fully enabled all the time, creates a potential to ignore much of the range of humanity. Okay, number two, access needs come from permanent disabilities. Fiction. It's important to remember that access needs can cover a whole host of things. Um, so as I mentioned before, like often when we think about web accessibility, people think of blind people using screen readers, um, but there's a lot more to it. And the Microsoft Inclusive Design Toolkit, I love it, so I'm gonna keep referring to it, um, identifies three categories of disability. So there's permanent, there's temporary, and there's situational. So permanent uh, disabilities and impairments might be things like being, hard, uh, being deaf, uh, or as I mentioned, being blind. Uh, temporary impairments might be due to a medical condition and situational impairments uh, may actually result from the environment around us, so the situation we're in at any time. Um, so even if you consider yourself not to have any form of disability, you could find yourself with a temporary or situational impairment at any time. Oh, there we go, some examples. So um, a temporary impairment might be something like having a migraine and getting visual aura, so difficulty seeing. You might have brain fog from an illness. There's a lot of people talking about that with COVID at the moment. Um, repetitive, strain, strain, repetitive strain injury, or RSI, from using the mouse too much. I'm sure we can all relate. Um, and situational might be a really bright light on the screen, um, loud noise, making it difficult to focus, holding a baby or, or some kind of tool. Uh, lots of parents with kids at home at the moment, obviously are uh, gonna have lots of distractions going on. And for permanent might be things like full blindness, partial blindness, uh, learning difficulties, um, or having a single arm. Um, and yeah, the design toolkit has this lovely illustration of some of the different kinds of permanent, uh, temporary and situational impairments that people might have. I just really enjoy the one for heavy accent. It's, it's absolutely ridiculous. Um, but they categorize the impairments into four categories. So there's um, touch, see, hear, and speak. So it's a whole range of kind of abilities and, and experiences. And uh, the World Health Organization says, disability is not just a health problem. It's a complex phenomenon reflecting the interaction between features of a person's body and features of the society in which they live. So that's the important thing to note. It doesn't necessarily translate to some kind of personal health condition. So we don't tend to think about people who need glasses as having a disability because society has accommodated them. And disability is not actually um, caused, it's, it's caused by the society that we live in, not accommodating a person's specific needs. Um, so if you think about um, if we accommodated all access needs in the same way as we did glasses wearers, um, we wouldn't actually have possibly have such a range of disabilities that we considered disabilities. Um, it's society that disables people. 
Okay, Num number three. I, I didn't put numbers on these, great. Um, accessibility is a legal requirement. Fact, it is indeed the law here in the UK and the USA. I can't speak for other countries. Um, in the UK, we've got the Equality Act 2010, which says a person concerned with the provision of a service to the public or a section of the public for payment or not, must not discriminate against a person requiring the service by not providing the person with the service, which is a very wordy way of saying, basically, if you provide a service to the public, everyone should be able to use it. No one should miss out because they can't use the service. So having an inaccessible website, for example, and then not providing a service to someone with a disability because they can't use it would be a breach of that law. And the Equality Act doesn't actually explicitly mention websites, but the Equality and Human Rights Commission's code of practice for putting the act into practice uh, does go into a bit more detail. So it says um, an organization needs to make reasonable adjustments um, so they don't have to go, you know, above and beyond to ridiculous like lengths, but they do have to at least try, for example, with changing font size and making sure dis disabled users can get information that they need. Even if they if the organization employs an external organization to build and maintain the website. So even if you get an agency to build your website, you're still on the hook for making sure it's accessible. And the EHRC might conduct a formal investigation. It can serve a non discrimination notice can act over persistent discrimination and also help someone prosecute a company. And there hasn't, as far as I'm aware, been any case law for this so far in the UK, um, but that could change at any time. And there certainly have been prosecutions in the States. All right, this is, a, this is a one I hear a lot. Accessibility is a barrier to good design. Well, that is rubbish. And when I hear it from senior designers, it makes me very sad indeed. Um, it's easy to imagine that in order for your website to be super accessible, it needs to look like this. Um, it's really not the case. In reality, accessible design is good design. So can you really say a design is good if it doesn't work for everyone? Web accessibility is everyone's job. It's not just our job as engineers. It starts at the design level, at the kind of conception level of a product. And it is crap to have to be the engineer that goes back to the designer constantly and say, we can't do this, it's not, accept uh, it's not accessible. So if your designer doesn't have the knowledge about accessibility yet, work with them to come up with something that does work for everyone. And there's a really great article on Medium by uh, someone called Jesse Housler who works at Salesforce and um, it's called Seven Things Every Designer Needs to Know About Accessibility. And he says, accessibility will not force you to make a product that's ugly, boring or cluttered. It will introduce a set of constraints to incorporate as you consider your design. I would recommend sharing this uh, article with your designer colleagues if you um, if you feel comfortable doing so. I think it is a really great article. So good design should factor in things like form labels. So don't rely on those placeholder attributes for uh, labels. They aren't the same. Uh, identifying form fields that are optional. So rather than identifying what's required. Uh, proper focus states for links, buttons and inputs. Don't turn them off. Even if they're ugly, you can style them with CSS or you can replace them with a different kind of indicator for focus, but don't remove them entirely. Um, having your dimensions in REM or other kind of standardized scalable units rather than pixels, which are exact. Uh, having a good color, color contrast between text and the background um, and avoiding potentially distracting animations or if you do want animations, making them manually triggered. So don't have them auto playing. All right, another one. Web accessibility is hard to implement. Fiction, kind of. In truth, it's actually hard to retrofit. So if you're dealing with a massive site that is inaccessible and it's been built in a really inaccessible way, then yeah, it's gonna be hard. Um, but it's no more of a nightmare than just doing a massive refactor anyway. Um, the key is really to start accessible if you can. Established in the guidelines from the beginning that designers and developers stick to. If you've got a design system, make sure it's accessible and using the right colors and stuff. Um, and make sure that you do stick to it as the web app grows. So if you're working on something, and if you're working on something that's already pretty accessible, um, make sure that every new thing that you add to it is accessible. It's tempting to say, oh, well, none of this is accessible, so I won't bother trying to make this new bit accessible. But actually, you're just kind of adding to the problem. So. Um, try and kind of improve rather than uh, leave things better than you found them. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot easier to have accessibility, accessibility by default than it is to add accessibility after the fact. 
And then there's a the concept of progressive enhancement. So this is the approach of building something very simple that works for everyone in all browsers. Yes, even Internet Explorer. Um, and then adding extra shiny things that will enhance the experience for people who can use it. So the people with uh, modern browsers. So like the core functionality of your app should work for everyone, regardless of the technology they're using. Um, and this applies to assistive technology as well. So braille displays or screen readers, a lot of them do use the internet like their Internet Explorer. It is like trying to build for so many different kinds of Internet Explorer. So you can use things like feature detection and CSS to add uh, extra functionality or JavaScript has similar things, I think, to check if a user's browser supports a certain feature before displaying it for them. And this is a really great example, um, a really great principle to adopt when you're starting out a new web project. Okay, HTML gives us accessibility for free. But this is like relevant to the previous point. Good old HTML is totally accessible. A screen reader is going to see some HTML tags and understand exactly what it's doing. And since HTML5 was introduced a pretty long time ago now, like there's pretty much a tag for everything. Um, there are a few tiny, there are a few handful of exceptions. So I read actually read a tweet today that was saying that the video tag is actually not accessible. So it does, I think ultimately it comes down to the browser's individual implementation of a tag. But for the most part, like the bread and butter of, of HTML is innately accessible. And the one, then there's pretty much a tag for everything. So we call it semantic HTML. So the tags that actually convey meaning about what they contain. So there's tags that indicate a, a different parts of a document, um, ones that mark up links and buttons, uh, there's tables and bits of tables, lists, figures and captions, and a description list for key value pairs of information. And all of these tags will tell uh, assistive technology exactly what each thing on the page is for. And that's really important. And ultimately, you can style almost anything you want to with CSS. So you don't have to sacrifice design for semantics here. Um, if you've got a link that executes some JavaScript when you click on it, it should be a button element. Um, and you can make it look like a link with CSS. Um, and if you've got a list of key value pairs containing information, so um, in this example here, we've got kind of some uh, labels and some um, values, I guess. Um, you can use a description list or even just an unordered list, a UL, so that a screen reader knows that it's not just like a paragraph of unstructured text. So many of the things that will help some groups of users with access needs will actually benefit others. So good semantic HTML is great for screen reader users, but also people who use the keyboard or adaptive switches, which are another kind of assistive technology. Um, because with the right tags, the browser knows what should be focusable and what isn't. And then labels on forms make them easier to read for everyone, um, regardless of their cognitive ability. So add a, an accessibility checklist to your JIRA uh, ticket templates or your PR templates as well. Make sure that it's part of your definition of done for whatever you're building. And do look out for best practices in your code reviews as well. Okay, React apps are inaccessible. I seem to follow two camps of people on Twitter. So there's people in the React community and there's people who hate the React community. Um, I'm by no means a fangirl of React who thinks it's like better than everything else. I mean, it's, it's good, obviously, I, I use it every day at work. I think it's just as good as some of the alternatives out there. So you don't always need React, sure, but this is rubbish. I, I'm so sick of hearing this. I don't know, I don't know about you, but it, I, it is something I've heard a lot over the last few years of using React. So there are still some people who seem to think that React apps are just inaccessible piles of divs. Um, and the truth is, if there are a million divs in a React app, it's because the developer put them there. It's not because of some intrinsic feature of React. So even the days of wrapping multiple elements in divs just to return from a function, that's long gone. Like we've got, we've had fragments for ages um, and often they don't actually return anything at all. So if you've written JSX, which I expect you have, because you're here, um, you'll know it's a bit like writing HTML with some extra stuff in it. Um, and all those lovely semantic HTML tags I just showed you work perfectly in React. So there's no reason to not use them. Um, we can add ARIA attributes to elements in the DOM to add a bit more information to assistive technology, um, what, fun what function these elements are actually playing. Um, so for things like menus and um, things that JavaScript adds interactivity to, 
it just adds a bit more um, description. So we can signal that clicking a button will trigger some kind of pop-up with ARIA has pop-up, or there's ARIA expanded, which indicates whether or not a menu is expanded. And you should never rely on ARIA roles when you can use semantic HTML elements instead. So when you're in, when in doubt, use good old fashioned semantic HTML. Okay, you can automate accessibility testing. Last one. Fact, sort of. To be more specific, you can automate some of your accessibility testing. So some examples of automated testing tooling, we've got Lighthouse, which is built into Chrome and it can be plugged into your continuous integration pipeline. Axe will warn you in the console about any accessibility problems. Um, and A11Y, I never know how to pronounce that, um, is a CLI, which does basically the same thing. Um, so they can do things like spot uh, incorrect nested headings. So it should be H1, H2, H3, H4. Um, images without the correct alt attributes, forms without labels. All of these things are pretty easy mistakes for humans to make. So it can help to have some kind of automated check to pick up on it. And people love to show off their Lighthouse scores. It's like a badge of honor. And that is all well and good, but it really doesn't tell the whole story. Uh, so Lighthouse checks for a lot of things. So performance, accessibility, best practices, according to Google, I guess, and SEO. And it is a great tool, but it is often treated as a silver bullet. So yeah, having a, a high lighthouse score is a good thing, but it doesn't mean that accessibility is kind of covered off. There are always going to be things that automated tools won't be able to detect. And so Firefox and Chrome both have an accessibility section in DevTools, which allows you to have a look at how assistive technology might see your, your site. So it's going to help you to spot anything that maybe isn't labeled properly or anything that's being accidentally overlooked. Um, it's not an entirely automated solution. It's kind of semi-automated, but um, not entirely manual. And browsers often have tools for color contrast as well. So um, you can inspect element and it will tell you whether the foreground and the background have enough contrast. So the best way to test uh, accessibility is to approach it from all sides. So automated tooling can and should be used in your workflow. Um, it's that quick feedback loop for common accessibility problems in your markup and your CSS. But what these tools don't account for are the things like the quirks of particular screen reader software. And as I mentioned, like, it, like they, are, they are pretty terrible. Like a lot of them, people will be using really old versions because some of them are quite expensive. And even some of them, are, even though some of them are open source, like they're not always reliable. It seems like each kind of screen reader um, on different platforms treats web pages completely differently. <laughs> so, and there's other kinds of assistive, assistive technology that people will use to access websites as well. So Lighthouse can't tell you whether your site's still legible when it's zoomed in 600% um, or whether you can interact with the various parts of the app with a keyboard in the same way that you would with a mouse. And um, there's an, a great article on the accessibility in government blog, which has a list of what they found when they tested the world's least accessible web page with automated tooling, um, which I've included the link in the, sli in the slides as well, which I'll share afterwards. So before you merge your PR, check how your new feature behaves with screen readers. So Macs and iPhones come with voiceover, Android has TalkBack, and uh, Windows has an open source one called NVDA, which you can download. So kind of check, does it read out everything it's, it's supposed to? Is it reading out anything it's not supposed to? Are the headings reading out in the right order? But ultimately there's no substitute for getting people with actual access needs to test the app. So you can, use some, you can do some user testing, you can commission a formal audit as well, um, or, and make sure that you have ways for real users to provide feedback as well. Include disabled users in your UX research upfront um, so that you you know that you could be building something accessible right from the beginning. And these three approaches are the best of friends and should be used together for mass, like maximum accessibility power. Um, people with access needs have their own way of doing things on the internet. And if you don't have access needs, it can be really hard to try and test for those things. Um, and they might use ways of using assistive technology that you haven't even thought about. So if you encounter any of the myths that I've mentioned, you can and should challenge them. And a lot of the time these myths stick around because accessibility just isn't really being talked about. Um, so be the one to bring it up, get others on board, educate your designers, bake accessibility into, into your design systems and your ways of working. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. I will share those slides afterwards.
have to stop that. Don't worry. It's okay. Uh, you should have a little thing there on the sharing thing that says stop. Thank you. Maybe something to learn for Zoom that to make that more obvious. Um, so uh, thank you so much for that. That was super, super interesting as well. Uh, I think this is a uh, ongoing conversation always around uh, accessibility. And I think you, you really did a good job of uh, busting some of those myths. Um, for those of you who have questions, please use the Slido link for that, uh, which reminds all of us that we have come to that point where we're going to invite all of the speakers back and uh, we're going to have a look at those questions and see. We're going to try to answer as many of them as we possibly can and have time for. Um, uh, I was just looking how we do for time and we're doing really well. So we have we have a lot of, it's going to be good. It's going to be a good session. Um, I'm just going to have a quick look at the, and let's start. I'm going to start with, well, I'm just going to get started. Uh, Louis, I can't uh, turn on my video. Ah. I think it was permission. Okay. So. Uh, there we go. No worries. Everyone's back. Uh, Okay, great. Um, yes, now we can see you all. Uh, right, so I'm going to ask the first question. I'm going to just get straight in there. Um, I think this one, I am assuming this one is for Anisha. Um, so this was an amazing talk. Uh, what testing framing, sorry, I can't, I can't even read now. What testing frameworks did you use for your unit integration tests? Yeah, so for unit testing, we use Jest, but we've got, a re I think if you've heard of React Testing Library, it's a really nice layer on top of Jest. So it makes it really easy to write readable tests. Um, and what's, I've lost the name of the guy who wrote it. This is like just baffled my mind, but I'll, I'll could give it a quick Google and get back to you on who it's, wrote it. Uh, can't see that. That what yeah, Kenzie Dodds, famous guy. I don't know why I forgot his name, <laughs> but yeah, Kenzie Dodds has a really good course on on how to get started with React testing library. Excellent, good, good. Thank you. Um, I've got another question here, and I think this one, uh, based on that question, I'm assuming this is for Daniela. Um, how and this is a big question, so <laughs> we don't need a whole thing here. But how uh, how does the end to end encryption? How is it done? Yeah, it's a tough question. Uh, I think myself, I don't know yet all the details, but uh, the main idea is mainly what we, we just talked. Uh, um, basically, uh, we have uh, something that we have for the TLS uh, handshake in the beginning. So in the beginning, uh, your public key are shared, your private key are kept to, to you. And when you want to send a message to a friend, let's say on Telegram uh, or Zoom, uh, something like a TLS connection and check is going on. Uh, and they try, to, the both try, the both clients try to exchange a secret that's going to be shared. And after that, uh, we are going to start symmetric encryption, as I talked uh, in the beginning. And that's going to be much faster. Uh, and yeah, that's, that's mainly it. in the beginning, asymmetric encryption after that, after uh, a session. Uh, and note that the session is not like a session like we have in the browser that you close the browser and that's it. A session only ends, uh, if I'm not mistaken, if you, if you change devices, for instance. That's why you sometimes see the message uh, in Telegram or uh, WhatsApp uh, that your friend keys were changed or something like that. A, a good, quick, concise response to a very big question uh, of having presented an <laughs> introduction to a very complex uh, topic. So thank you. Going more detail would uh, have me talking about like a lot of concepts and algorithms, and I don't think it's like the purpose for now. But uh, I, I think uh, uh, if you look at the white papers from uh, WhatsApp, Telegram, uh, and Signal, you will see uh, what what we're talking about and it's basically more or less uh, for each of them the same and i i also think that we have a uh, there's an opportunity here for inviting you back for another talk on this topic so <laughs> thank you for that uh, question for sophie here um sophie is there any way to test if a react component is accessible or how much accessible it is if that makes sense okay um, I guess you'd be testing 
what comes out. Um, if you're talking in terms of like React testing library and stuff, um, if you've got ARIA attributes that respond to changes in the JavaScript, for example, um, a menu that expands and then you've got the ARIA expanded, you could test to see what that attribute, the value of that attribute is after you've interacted with the element. Um, I think you can also do that with Cypress and for end, test, end to end testing as well. But I, I do think that the best thing in that case would be to test the, the website once it's been built, right? So you load up your website and then um, you can look through the DOM, you can look through the elements to see what they look like. You can run those various automated tooling, um, automated tools. And also you could, if, I mean, if you're using something like Anisha mentioned Storybook, right? So you can test out your components in isolation in Storybook. And that's actually got a little accessibility um, overview panel as well. So that's got some great kind of low level basic checks for um, things like labels and, and out attributes and stuff. And yeah, see if you can interact with the component in the right way using the keyboard. Um, so yeah, it doesn't have to be a part of the whole website, but um, I think ultimately, yeah, it's the HTML that comes out the other end that you really care about. Great, some really good tips there. Um, I don't want to, to no, grab, grab your question, but yeah. one thing that helped us uh, a lot, uh, my team, recently uh, was using uh, uh, the testing library because you have this get by role uh, and you can use it a lot and actually it, that maps to the ARIA attributes too. So you can play with that. And uh, I think that was really great for us. So I would like that, I think it's relevant to share. That sounds really good. I'm probably gonna steal that, thank you. <laughs> Excellent, brilliant. Um, so I, so going back to Anisha, this is a question about, uh, you mentioned Agile, Agile, Agile. And I have a question here is, uh, I'm wondering what Agile methods you use during the short amount of time and how did that work out? Yeah, so we, we did develop by sprints, but I think when I, what I meant by that was making sure you were doing Agile in the sense that you were building a minimum viable product first, and then you're adding features in along the way. So making sure that you're developing a feature by feature basis. So say you've got a search page and as a, as a product, this needs to go out, it needs to be searchable. Build that first and then build things that are nice to have, like say filtering, sorting. Um, so that's what I meant by, yeah, build it by feature by feature basis. Yeah, see, see where you can add maximum value step by step, basically. Yeah. Excellent. Um, we have another question about um, accessibility. So back to you, Sophie. Uh, so great talk, Sophie, from Stefani here. Um, how to convince the team or a client to address accessibility problems and what consequences could they, uh, if it's not taken into account? Yeah, um, this is a tricky one. Uh, so if there's always the kind of slightly, I guess, the one that makes me feel kind of bad is when you can, if you really can't sell it to them, tell them it makes SEO, it's good for SEO. So um, search engines crawl websites and they are the, the best picture that they're gonna get of the website is from really good accessible markup. So that's, I guess, the kind of nuclear option of like, okay, these people really don't care about accessibility well you know good for business but i mean ultimately it, it makes you look like you care about your users um so having a good accessible website like by saying that you don't want to make these accommodations you're saying that you don't want to accommodate a whole host of people i think the microsoft inclusive design toolkit is great because it does draw attention to the fact that it's not just kind of permanent disabilities like it's 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 a whole host of reasons why people might need a bit of like I guess leeway using your website and um, and I think um, what was I going to say um, yeah it's just um, it's the you're just much more likely to keep people on the website if it's easy to use if it's well structured um, and yeah I, I I struggle the more that I get into this and the longer I'm developing like I I struggle to see the arguments against it it doesn't take more time to build stuff accessibly. I think the biggest 
the biggest kind of challenges are going to be if you're dealing with a massive application that's not accessible and you're having to do work to make it accessible. Um, but then, yeah, just thrust that Equality Act in their face and going, we're breaking the law um, might help as well. Yeah, I think it's uh, it sounds a little bit like the usual sort of if you can argue the business case, um, that's that's always a really good thing when it comes to anything really. And as you as you rightfully pointed out, everyone every business favorite uh, it is good for SEO. So <laughs> absolutely. Um, any other comments? I saw Anisha, you wanted to comment on that as well. Yeah, I was going to jump in. So we we do a lot of work with clients, obviously, and clients obviously money is time so convincing them to to spend time on accessibility i had a project with the food standards agency um and obviously they're government so they have to regulate and build to accessibility standards and and what we did was just got got the client to sit there with the blindfold and told them to use the site and it, it, it drives the point home i mean it's like you put yourself in somebody else's shoes and see how it works so brute force might work sometimes <laughs> <laughs> I think that's brilliant. Excellent. That's a really good tip. Um, so uh, we, we're going to go back to Daniela. Uh, we are back uh, on encryption. Um, so Daniela, what's the role of uh, Cypher suite, suites in TLS encryption? I, I can't say read now either. In TLS encryption. <laughs> Um, so it, it's, um, I tried to show that a bit uh, in the slide that uh, you saw with the um, client hello and the server uh, hello. Basically, the client hello uh, is going when there is this message sent by the client, which is your browser, let's say, uh, the client is going to say, oh, I have all these uh, Cypher suites that I support. And then the server is going to select one of them. And the Cypher suites itself are just like a, a suite, let's say, <laughs> a set of uh, algorithms that can be used. And in this case, uh, um, they can be used for uh, multiple tasks. Uh, for instance, what are the symmetric, symmetric encryption that we are going to use? What are the asymmetric encryption that we are going to use? How we are going to do authentication? How are we uh, going to use the um, message authentication codes, which is the algorithm that we are going to use because there are different algorithms. Uh, for instance, it could be um, based on uh, hashing. Uh, and in that case, uh, it's called the uh, HMAC. So uh, hashing uh, message authentication code. Uh, so it could, it's really, the, the suite is just really the, the amount of algorithms that we are going to use to translate our messages between the browser and the, ser the server. Awesome, great. Um, I hope that was a good response for whoever asked that question. I was very informative, thank you. Um, again, accessibility, back, back to you, Sophie. Um, what are your top tips for implementing web accessibility in a new personal project or in portfolio work? Okay, the first one would be semantic HTML. The second one would also be semantic HTML. And the third one would also be semantic HTML. I feel like um, it's semantic HTML. Yeah, like it's like keep get, make it put as much into the HTML as you can. Um, so if you're building a React app, a lot of React apps are client side only. Um, and I actually work on a client side only app, which is client side only just because we have some problems um, getting our API calls to work on the server side, we're working on it. But the issue with that is that if uh, assistive, assistive technology doesn't support JavaScript, or very well at least, um, then they don't get the full experience if they're using that. So um, ideally your app should be as much HTML as possible, or even a website, um, not, not necessarily a web app. Um, so my own website's actually literally just HTML and like vanilla JavaScript. Um, which is fun, actually. <laughs> I do quite enjoy doing that sometimes. Um, yeah, so um, if you are building a React app, you, I recommend something like Next.js, which provides like uh, server-side rendering, or even better, it does automatic static optimization, which means it's it kind of generates a static page where it can. Um, so that's like even better because then it's just loaded. You're not kind of dependent on JavaScript to see any um, any of the content. Cool, great, thank you. Um, back to Anisha, um, you mentioned in your talk DevOps from day one. 
um, how can we, if we are a small team without DevOps, which DevOps technologies do you recommend to start? So how do we go on about that? So I'm actually just right now sitting my AWS certification. So I found it really easy to use. Um, I think they, they've got really good courses and you come out of it with with like a certificate saying you can do AWS. Um, but but I know a lot of the cloud platform providers offer courses on it. But I think if it's a small project, you 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 might if you're going into production, you can you can make sure that your your dev team is skilled up on on doing the deployments themselves um, and keep the processes in house. But I think having a cross functional team when you're a small team is the best way to go about it. And personally, I, personally, I'm not a big fan of doing DevOps myself, but every every developer should know how to do it. So personally, yeah, I'd say AWS is pretty easy to use if if you can afford it. Excellent. I'm I'm sure there is a discussion there on whether everyone should know it or, uh, but <laughs> if it's um, at least be aware of it, I totally agree. Um, so we have another question for Daniela. Um, are you aware of any automated tools to test security standards in the same way that we might test sites meets accessibility standards that we've been talking about? Uh, I think that would be a great product. <laughs> I know that uh, there are uh, some interesting uh, things uh, going on. Um, I read recently uh, a paper uh, called uh, Crylogger. And I know that the source code is, is open source, so you can take a look at it. Uh, I believe uh, if I'm not uh, mistaken, I'm, I don't think, uh, but uh, it's, it's the, the, that project was built to, uh, to access uh, Android applications, uh, but it also mentions some related work. So uh, probably there's uh, something already and uh, I know one company, but I don't recall the name right now. Um, so the one you mentioned, maybe you can post it in the uh, chat if you have, or if you if you share it with um, yeah. us, I'll I'll I'll, sh I'll share it. Um, just to mention, there are a couple of links that have been shared in the chat. So for anyone, go through those. Uh, there is, I think, it was a course that we talked about the Kento, uh, the We Are Purple about a capitalism-centered case for accessibility. So there are some really good resources there. Uh, brilliant stuff, everybody. Um, so uh, on to next questions. Um, so Sophie, talking about accessibility. So I know we hear this a lot and uh, you can never really be stressed enough, I guess. Um, and for me as a product designer or, or kind of working more with design, I think one of the things that we always do in general is that we think of the general we, uh, as in our tech, we are tech conscious, we, we work in industry, uh, we live in this awareness bubble and we often forget that we're not designing, the people that we're designing for are not the same people. And um, I think one way, uh, Anisha, you were mentioned some awesome way of testing this, but um, just as a personal anecdote, uh, because of the pandemic, I a while, my, while back moved in with my father, who is in his early 70s. And uh, living with an older person, it's an amazing way to understand that the person that you're designing for isn't always as well as you. And he has all the latest tech. He has the latest iPhone, much newer than I do, the one I have, and the iPad. And he's on his um, big TV trying to get into Netflix. And every day I get questions, which to me, working in industry, is just so obvious. And um, I know he's kind of sort of driving a little bit away from accessibility, but I do just think what you were mentioning about understanding who you're designing for is so important. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great example of accessibility. You know, we re remember it's not just about kind of physical impairments, it's about all sorts of things like an accessible website with labels on the forms, like accessible design with, yeah, labels on the forms and kind of clear controls um, are gonna help people of all ages and of all technical abilities. Um, so a fact that I like to roll out in these kind of situations is that the average reading age in the UK is 10 years old. Um, so for people, for av like the average reader in the UK is not going to be able to read like massive bodies of, of, of complicated text or, or use kind of really uh, technical words. So um, I always point people towards the government websites. So GDS, the Government Digital Service, does an absolutely brilliant job at yeah. building accessible websites. I use their design systems as guidelines for the components that we're building. 
Um, so they're the ones that, for example, don't put, uh, they put optional on form labels to show you exactly what you don't need to fill out rather than what you do. Um, and they are a prime example of a website who has a service that is used by everyone from, uh, you know, people at school to my grandmother, probably if she had the internet. Um, but um, yeah, so they're, they're a brilliant way of seeing the, 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 the way that you can build a website that works for absolutely everyone. Yeah. I'll say my parents can't use Netflix either. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think a lot of people who discovered that about their uh, about their relatives uh, in, uh, during this last year. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, uh, myself, I totally agree with you. I think GDS website is amazing. I think that their their guide and references are are, uh, are really something that everybody should be checking out. Um, so Daniela, your topic today it was it was quite a complex topic, and I think you know, uh, kudos to you for making it um, somewhat understandable for all of us. Uh, but for those of you, for those who are keen to kind of find out more information about cryptography and learn more or start a journey on, on knowing more about cryptography, what, what's your uh, what's your hot tips? Uh, so I have uh, um, checked a lot of blog posts <laughs> in the beginning to try to see what I could get. Uh, I asked some uh, some friends at work also. Um, and uh, in the beginning, uh, um, there was someone that recommended me looking at a book that has, uh, I don't know, I think it's from, uh, to, maybe, yeah, I think it has like 10, 12, 12 years, I'm not sure. It's called The Tangled Web. Uh, and uh, it has a lot of um, concepts. You need to take a look at the book and understand some of the things were already done, but uh, it has some concepts. Um, and there's another one called the uh, serious cryptography uh, i think it's also a really good recommendation um, then uh, uh, i looked at some videos on youtube that i think were great from a computer file and also from a, a f5 uh, dev center i can send you the links uh, afterwards um, and yeah, that was mainly it. Also looking into the APIs I shared, the web crypto cryptography API and the Node.js one, uh, they have, uh, and even um, not only looking at the spec, but also MDN has some examples. So it's cool. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, please do share those and we will pass them on. Um, uh, so uh, we're back with Anisha again. I've got another question for you here, Anisha. Um, so this is actually, I think this is a reference back to the DevOps question. Uh, so uh, what do you mean by doing DevOps? Does DevOps mean tooling or culture? If it's tooling, what tooling um, an organization should be using? You mentioned AWS uh, as a starting point, but what's um, what you're thinking? Yeah, so I mean, DevOps is definitely a culture. Um... I think, but there are toolings to help assist the culture and to get you to get your DevOps practices and your CI CD pipelines running. Um, so for for continuous integration and development um, tooling, is that was that the question? Sorry, I uh, yeah, if it's tooling, what tooling uh, should an organization be using? I mean, so where where I work, um, tooling is usually decided by the client. Um, so they usually have a preference for their suppliers. For my personal project, I used uh, Heroku, which is really easy to use. You just, it literally just does a lot of the things for you. But there's a lot of um, easy to use tooling, like GitHub has its own um, version of things that you can use. Um, there's, there's all the different cloud platforms, yeah, that have courses on how to use them. But I think it just depends on the size of your project, what, what you intend to use it for. Um, but DevOps as a culture uh, is a whole other topic. <laughs> Again, another opportunity uh, to have another talk and put together, Anisha. Yeah. So thank you. Uh, uh, actually, I've got another question just straight on for you as well, Anisha. Uh, with Strapi, or Strapi um, how tricky was it to set up and get people adding content? Yeah, so I mean, in a project that took four weeks to build, we had people adding content to Strapi like within the first sprint. So it was super easy to use. There's some really, really good tutorials. Um, I'm currently using it myself to build something. Um, and it's just got really nice um, APIs that are easy to read information off of. The fact that it exposes GraphQL endpoints makes it really, really integratable with like React um, and other, other, other projects you might be using it with. 
but their documentation is fantastic. And I think because it's open source, it gives you a chance to even give back, contribute back components or things you might think they might find useful. That's awesome. Nice. Um, so Sophie, we talked, I mean, obviously you gave a lot of hot tips on accessibility and what to do and what not to do. Uh, but what would you say is the kind of most common accessibility mistake that you see engineers make? Or designers and designers or engineers? Yeah, um, I think from an engineering point of view, it's probably the not using the right element for the job. So like, I've seen a lot of things like um, LI or uh, A anchor elements with on click in JavaScript, which isn't um, semantic at all. Like you should have a button and style it differently in CSS. Um, well, yeah, forms without labels or that material design thing where like the, the label is like inside the field and moves up like I hate that. I mean, it's, it's OK, maybe it looked cool like a few years ago, but it's ultimately really crap if you're trying to just fill out a form and maybe you're using the keyboard and it doesn't like move properly or like um, you can't you're struggling to read it because the text has gone really small. Um, just just put the label there. I don't know why a lot of designers seem to be like scared of labels. Um, but uh, yeah, so I think I think that's that up there. And um, actually, this is a really common one, which is born out of people trying to do the right thing. So I can't hold it against anyone. But when you're adding alt attributes to an image, make sure that it's actually useful. So is the image just like decorating? Is it there to break up a large block of text? In which case, if it, if it doesn't give useful information to the reader, um, do you actually need to give it an alt attribute or can you just use empty an empty string as an alt attribute? So that's a common one. I mean, if it just says picture of a cat or something, I'd argue, is it is it really worth pointing that out or is it just gonna make the screen reader take longer to read out the text? It's all those, uh, all those pictures of random cats on the internet. So. <laughs> finding their way in even to uh, even to accessibility problems. Uh, okay, great. So we're coming towards the end, but I do have one question for all of you. Uh, and this is kind of more a general question. Um, I've got a question here. Um, as women in tech, have either of you faced any challenges or on? Um, so um, yeah, let's, let, let's hear about a quick around around that. Um, Daniela, do you want to go first? No, not really. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I volunteered you. Uh, well, I think it's a tough question. Um, I mean, uh, no, in general, no. Uh, I, I, sometimes people ask that, but I, I, for me, I think uh, I've been done my business. I try to, to go as deep as possible on topics, try to understand all the, the concepts. Uh, try to have meaningful discussions uh, with people and try to sometimes prove myself, I guess. Uh, but uh, I, I don't think I had like a, a session that I would say, okay, uh, that was really good because I'm a woman or that was really bad because I'm a woman. I don't think so. Uh, so, no. <laughs> oh, that, that's good to hear. That's good to hear. Um, Anisha? Yeah, I mean, I guess it is a difficult one to answer. I, I mean, personally, I, I, where I work, everyone's really supportive. Um, and I'm quite lucky, you know, that that the team of people I work with, they they obviously care a lot about diversity and inclusion. Um, but I think for me, one of one of the things I I struggle with is finding mentorship. So being like a young woman in the tech industry, a lot of my managers male, his managers male like the chain just goes up and um I actually just reached out to Sophie like before this to to say like do you want to have a chat because I'd love to hear from somebody who's been in the industry a bit more um but yeah I think for me that's just that's the one like just finding mentorship to to know where to go uh from people who might be able to relate because right now maybe I might not be thinking about things like kids or I'm only 25 but but f along the way like when those sort of issues arise, it'd be nice to talk to to somebody who maybe could relate. Yeah, totally understandable. Great, thank you. Uh, Sophie? Yeah, totally agree with that. Um, I recognise that, like, you know, I 
have a fair amount of privilege. Like I, um, I'm a woman in tech, but I am a white woman in tech. Um, I, I think the main thing I felt throughout my career is just being outnumbered, um, which isn't necessarily a bad thing in itself. It's just a little bit wearing like, and I feel like my current, like the place that I've, in fact, the, both places, the, the, both the places I've worked for the longest have been quite good. I feel like Monda has a really supportive culture um, and I've been really lucky to have some great female role models along that way as well. Um, but what I think the worst part for me was actually on the internet, which should be no surprise to anyone. Like I had a couple of Twitter posts that went viral and ended up like going to horrible places on the internet. And I think the most offended was when someone was like, leave her alone, she's learning React. And I'm like, bitch, I'm a mid-level developer. Excuse me. Um, that was a few years ago. But um, yeah, I think um, one of the things that helped me the most was actually joining community groups. So like I started going to like a women in Java group about four years ago um, and um, then yeah I started seeking out like women like women in tech kind of groups and I've actually kind of moved away from that a bit more now because um sometimes I feel like the segregation of like women's tech events um can be actually it's actually doing more to like it's, it's those ones that are like top 10 women in whatever lists and it's just like why can't we all be on the list like um, and the reason I like React JS Girls is because like everyone is welcome to come to the events and it's just like women get the platform. Um, so yeah, women React JS Girls has actually like been brilliant for like helping me meet some fantastic people in the community. So thanks. That is a very, very nice. Thank you. That's awesome. Uh, thank all the three of you for answering that. Um, so we actually have a little bit more time. So I thought um, we have some really good questions and uh, we actually gone through all the questions. Um, but in that case, I, I actually have one more question for Anisha. And it's about um, designers and developers. So I feel like I have to ask this question because I come from a product design background myself. And, uh, you know, I work a lot with engineers and I think that the relationship between designers and developers should be, can be, and, sh and is beautiful. Um, so given the short time span that you guys have to do this, uh, did your team, did you have to put an extra effort in to get sort of designers and engineers to play nicely together? Or were everybody sort of besties from day one? Or, or how, 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 how did that work? Yeah, so it's, it's actually a weird one because we had our designer offboarded during the whole process. And I kicked up a big fuss about this saying, how can you expect us to be continuously developing without our designer? Um, because I feel like it should be an ongoing process. I think, especially on such a short time scale, um, you need to, I, I felt like sometimes I had to push back on certain design decisions, but I'm not a designer. So I didn't know whether or not that was important. Um, and having that designer feedback that this is why this is important really helped me understand that like, help feedback the team why maybe something had to be done the way it was, it was being done. Um, but I think I, I'm quite lucky that I'd met a lot of the people that I worked with beforehand. But I think virtually it's it's a matter of making the time to to not only like get your whole team to not only just your developers meeting each other and like even if it is on Zoom and integrating, but your entire team and putting in that effort from the get go. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I think it's super important and especially as you say now it's kind of like on Zoom calls and I think just like. Uh, building the relationship between designers and developers starts on day one of the team being put together and everybody kind of starting at the same point. I think it's a, it's a constant ongoing day in discussion, but yeah. So that's why I wanted to ask that. Um, I also have a one question for Sophie uh, because you mentioned um, is accessibility hard or not? And if it is legacy, yes, then it is hard. And I couldn't help then putting question together of, what tips, if you have any, would you give to anyone who wants to tackle that beast of legacy and try to retrofit accessibility? Where do they start or should they not even bother and start fresh? <laughs> uh, make sure that you have good ways of dealing with stress. Um, I think um, 
a good place to start if you don't already have a design system would be to develop that. So put your time into developing a really nice accessible design system and start swapping out some of those, um, some of the components in that app for the design system. So that's what we did uh, with one of our applications at Monzo. And so we've been able to replace quite a lot of the, um, the kind of crafty um, older bits with, with some of the newer components. And that has the added benefit of also making it easier for future developers to then go and add new stuff without kind of repeating the same mistakes of the past. Um, so yeah, bit by bit, it's not going to be something, you, I mean, realistically, I can't imagine a company ever being like, yeah, go and spend like a month on this. Absolutely. Let's not deliver any new features. Who needs features? Um, but it's something you can do bit by bit when you have a bit of time and just replace some bits. As you're building new features, replace some bits while you're there. Um, I think that's the best way to attack it, really. It's probably going to take ages, but it's all worth it in the long run. A, lo a long, slow process that will be worth it. Um, so we just got one last question in. So we're going to take this question. Um, and then after that, we're going to wrap up. Um, so this is a question again to all of you as a whole. Um, do you find a more, do, do you find that you are more pushed into front end as a career path over the back end? All of you are thinking, I can see your brains are, uh, Anisha. I can go. So I actually, I have found that as a, as a woman, I feel like this is something I discussed actually was that I feel like women do tend to get pushed more in front of like vocational roles as well. I feel like if it's like a pitch or, or. I, f I don't know why specifically, but it, it seems to happen to where you get taken away from the technical side and told to do more of the, um, maybe because, I mean, I personally don't know. For, for me, my personality suits suits be talking because I just like talking. <laughs> but but again, like I don't want my career to end up in a place where that's what I'm known for versus being good at my job. Um, I prefer front end, so that's a difficult one for me to answer. Fair enough. Great. Uh, Daniela? Um, on my side, I think I, I initially, when I started uh, my career, I started doing both, like a full stack um, person, uh, doing trying to do uh, everything and try to understand a bit of everything. I think it's really valuable like to know uh, what's going to happen between the browser and the server? What uh, what are we doing? Are we doing authentication? Are we integrating with uh, PayPal? Uh, are we just uh, trying to do some CSS to make some positions? Uh, um, are we communicating uh, with the, um, uh, with your client with your product? In in some cases, are we communicating with the design? Uh, do you have, do you have, uh, do you you, do you have a PM to work with? I think uh, uh, for me, it was a mix in a way. So I did a lot of uh, backend in the past, also with um, Node.js for a while uh, in the Happy.js community. Uh, but right now I feel that I'm much more focused on the front end. Uh, but uh, uh, in a way, right, also I, I found this niche uh, in crypto, uh, which seems r really kind of a mix in between. Uh, so I managed to do a, a bit of everything. And uh, the thing I like the most is actually to be able to communicate with the, all parties. So uh, be able to communicate with the designers and discuss with them and say, hey, this is not the line, come on. Can we agree on a name? I think that <laughs> sometimes we call um, something like a, a toast. Some other people call it an alert where we need to agree on something also to create the design system and blah, blah blah on other side talking with the product owner trying to understand what the business wants trying to get all these responsibilities and uh, in another side talking with the people from the server and trying to establish a contract with with with, uh, with them um and uh, in particular uh, at my current job it's it's really important to, to establish that contract because if you are a developer for uh, multiple platforms and multiple device, uh, devices, I'm mainly on the web, but there are Android and iOS also. So we need to all to agree uh, on, on something. Uh, and I, I think I also like that part. And uh, that's why being in front end and in this, uh, a bit on, in the center of all these communications is also really important to me. Um, 
the rest, I think it goes in with your interests and what you like the most. I know some people that, uh, some women that also love being uh, doing stuff on the back end. So I think that's really what you want to do. Excellent. Yes. What, is, what you prefer is what you should be doing, what you enjoy the most. Uh, Sophie? Yeah, um, I actually started as a backend developer, like Java was the first thing I learned. Um, and I actually, I just ended up doing Node for a project because it seemed like a good idea at the time. And then I kind of fell into a React role and then just kind of, I was quite useful as a React developer in my company. So I stayed as a React developer and then I got a new job as a React developer, but I've always stayed full stack because I really love, I, d I don't, I guess I kind of get bored if I'm always doing front end. So like I lean into the front end quite heavily at, at work, but also I do write a lot of Go. Um, I used to write a lot of Kotlin. Um, so I just find it more interesting. And also it it does uh, exactly what Daniela was saying. Like you, you kind of get a bigger picture of things like I'm uh, so I'm a tech lead on a on a squad and I need to have that context on of like how of what's going on across the stack although mobile applications are deeply confusing but um, I think the front end thing is quite interesting like my friend once is my friend's a web developer and actually she went to a meetup once and and someone said oh you must be a front end developer <laughs> like because she was a woman um, and I, I love that because it's just like why is it when I go to every other React meetup in London, it's full of men? Like, if if all the front ends of developers are women, I I just don't get that complete like ridiculous stereotype. And um, and yeah, I think we do often get kind of pigeonholed into like things with so-called soft skills. Mm -hmm. Really, they're skills that everyone should like. A good developer will have great communication skills because like they can talk to stakeholders, they can explain technical concepts without sounding like Mr. Robot. Like, I think, mm -hmm. I think that actually the skills that we, that, that we stereotypically are pigeonholed into are just skills that people feel bad about not having, basically. I agree. I think that's, I, I totally agree with that. I think it's also super important to have the soft skills regardless or whether you are a back and front end designer uh, engineer or whether you are a designer is just, it's, it's what we need to work well as a team. Um, okay, so that is, I'm gonna take one last look, but I'm also looking at the time. So we have come to the end. Um, I want to start by saying a massive thank you to our speakers, um, Sophie, Daniela and Anisha. Thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, there's been so much learning done here today. So much was learned. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, we should also say thank you to our sponsor, WildD, and uh, the community team at WildD for organizing this and making sure that all the bits and bobs are working behind the scenes. And as you heard, WildD is hiring. So if you're interested in what we have on offer at the moment, do check out our website or reach out. Um, you can find the contact details on the website. And Obviously, the last and the biggest thank you, a hugest one of all, should go to all our lovely viewers and to the community for tuning in and spending the time here with us today. Uh, from all corners of the world, I am so excited to see people all the way from Ecuador to Egypt to London to Portugal, you know, and uh, myself being in Sweden. So this has been a really, really awesome. Thank you, everybody. Uh, make sure that you follow us on Meetup to find out when we are back, when our next event is going to take place. And uh, also follow us on Twitter at ReactJSGirls and check out the hashtag, hashtag ReactJSGirl, uh, where you can see uh, fun tweets from today, good quotes. Uh, I've already spotted some uh, cool photos. So that is it, everybody. Uh, we have come to the end. Thank you so, so much. And um, have a lovely evening, afternoon, morning, wherever you are in the world. Take care.